Well, the Lord be with you. As you're turning in your Bible to the 12th chapter of Mark, I do want to thank Mike for being with us this morning. Thank you so much for filling in. It means a lot to us to know we've got a deep bullpen. That we can show. Of course, if you show up for choir practice, I mean, we, we can always cut you the check if you want. So, um, Mark chapter 12, beginning in verse 38. As he taught, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. And then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had. All she had to live on. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O oh God, help us to hear what you would have us to hear, or that we may do what you call us to do, so that we may be the people you call us to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, when I was a kid, I don't know if this was the same for you. I lived in a slightly different sort of community. But when I was a kid, it was always such an odd experience to run into a teacher from school somewhere outside of school. Right? It was like, it was like seeing an ostrich or something. I can't quite explain it. It was just sort of jarring, really. Uh, there I'd be walking beside the buggy with my mom, and who should happen to be bent over the meat cooler shuffling through the pork chops but Miss Smith, my fourth grade teacher. It was odd. Outside of school. Teachers lived outside of school. I wouldn't know what to do. So I'd have this debate in my mind. Do I keep quiet, try to hide, maybe uh, just go unnoticed? After all, I don't think they knew who my mom was. Should I keep this distance between home and school alive? Or should I call out her name, using this unusual moment to show my mama, no, 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 Miss Smith really meant the thing she wrote in my report card about me. She wasn't lying, and here she is. But I always went for the first option, thinking it was better to go unnoticed, not taking any chances to sully my own image in the mind of my teacher who also saw me outside of school. It was always an odd thing to run into a teacher outside of that context, Monday to Friday, outside of the school building. It was, however, all the more odder, were odder whenever I ran into a teacher who was clearly hoping not to run into students. This happened one day when my mom and I stopped in at the Beeline on the way home one summer afternoon. The Beeline's a gas station. It's still there, just a couple of blocks uh, north of the Bow Weevil Monument. So if you're passing through Enterprise now, you can stop, turn right, because you're probably heading south to the beach. Turn right, just across the railroad tracks. There it is, little gas station. You can go inside and go, wow, this is the place, the Beeline. Last time I was there, just a little over a year ago, at the same place. Pumps don't take a credit card. Bars on the windows, bars on the doors. Even two crock pots with canned boiled peanuts and an old coffee pot somewhere in the back corner. But it was at the beeline that my mom and I ran into Mr. Garth. Now I have to tell you, Mr. Garth is sort of a legend in Enterprise. A well-respected, well-loved elementary school teacher eventually worked in the superintendent's office. He had been my mom's sixth grade teacher, my stepbrother's sixth grade teacher. But by the time I reached sixth grade, he had already moved on. But I knew Mr. Garth and he knew me. He was a tall, slender African-American man who always wore a white short sleeve shirt and a tie to teach in the classroom. And he spoke with a seriousness in his voice that said he loved education but loved his students more. 
Everybody loved Mr. Garth. Even people who hadn't met him loved Mr. Garth. So you can imagine what that was like to walk into the beeline and have this sort of disorienting feeling because who was there at the counter? Mr. Garth, outside of school, not wearing his white short sleeve shirt, not wearing his tie. There he was. And he was buying something. Now, I couldn't tell what it was because just as quick as my mama said, Hey, Mr. Garth, that's my mama's voice. <laughs> maybe she didn't, maybe she won't see this. Just as sure as she said that, this legend of a man spun around to face us with his wares tucked behind his back. I think he may have said one or two things to my mom. Oh, Jackie, how you doing? It's good to see you again. Oh, hey, Chris, you having a good summer? Oh, well, I got to go. And then he moonwalked <laughs> out of the beeline, out the door into his car. I remember thinking, how strange. When we got back in the car, I asked my mom, I said, Mama, what's wrong with Mr. Garth? She said, nothing. He just didn't want you to see that beer he had bought. Now, as an adult, I wouldn't think twice about seeing Mr. Garth at the Beeline buying beer. For one thing, he's a grown adult. What he does with his time and money is his business. But I also know, as I got to know Mr. Garth when I got older, that there's not a doubt in my mind that he didn't crack one of those open he, in his car. He wasn't going home in nefarious purpose without alcohol. He was a responsible, respectable man. He was Mr. Garth, after all. And he was a black educator in southeast Alabama for a number of years. His respect was not handed to him. He had earned it. But as a kid, as a kid who went to the same school where Mr. Garth had taught, and there was this program called D.A.R.E. that told us about the dangers of drugs and alcohol. And here I was, and my mama told me Mr. Garth had bought beer. My, the gates of hell could have opened. Mr. Garth, of all people, buying beer. This man, so many of us had put on a pedestal, came tumbling down in my sight as a child simply because he had done something that I, in my adolescent mind, believed to be horrendous and hypocritical. But isn't that what happens to those people that we deem exemplary? Isn't that what happens to those people that we place up on pedestals? Eventually, they fail. Eventually, they, they break under the weight of our expectation. Eventually, whether we're children or adults, they let us down. So why do we do it? Why do we put people up on a pedestal in the first place? Or better yet, why do we strive so hard to climb up the thing ourselves? Why do we want to elevate ourselves? to such lofty places of piety. Isn't that what happens in this text? Isn't that what Jesus is talking about in this first crew that he witnesses? Isn't this what he warns his disciples about? The scribes come by. Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes, to be greeted in the marketplaces, to have the best seats at church, to have the place of honor at banquets, and for the sake of appearance, love to go on and on. When they say prayers at grace, you better hope the food is already cold because it's going to get there. They love to say these long prayers. These scribes were the official scholars of the law, headquartered there in Jerusalem. These were Jerusalem scribes. These were the smartest ones associated with the cultic machine that was the temple. They knew their Bible. And they wanted to be sure that everyone knew that they knew their Bible. They wore long robes even when it was hot to make sure everybody knew we're the scribes. They wanted people to approach them as they walked down the street. They wanted, when they went into the beeline, for the little boy behind them, Mom, Mom, that's a scribe. A scribe. They wanted, when they walked into the restaurant, for the hostess to go over into that nice big corner booth, tell that family of four, I'm sorry, y'all going to have to move. There's a table over by the toilets and the fountain drinks. Y'all go sit over there. The scribes are here. That's what they wanted. They wanted to be placed on a pedestal to have folks recognize them. They wanted to use, people to use them as an example. Boy, those scribes sure do know their Bible. 
That's what they wanted people to say. They must be something special to know all those chapters and verses, to have it in their hearts, to walk around with the Bible not only tucked under their arm, but in their brain. And oh, when they prayed, oh, we just love to hear the scribes pray. That's what they wanted people to say. Yeah, these scribes wanted folks to offer them some reverence, some recognition for their holy office. Really, these scribes were the type of folks who would never say it in mixed company, but when they'd come over to each other's house, maybe having coffee or something together, one of them might say, well, you know, I know it's not nice to say, but since it's just us, you know, we're all scribes, and, and you all know we are just a little bit better than them, right? It doesn't take much. It doesn't take much for Jesus then when he sees these scribes to crack the porcelain base of the pedestal they're trying to climb when Jesus says they devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance, not the sake of holiness, but the sake of appearance, say long prayers. They, Jesus says, will receive the greater condemnation. But isn't that first thing sort of interesting? They devour widows' houses. You know what it makes me think of? It makes me think of those TV preachers with their slick back hair, their bleached teeth, their sky-high promises of, if you would just sow a financial seed of $1,000 into my ministry, God will send you 10. Knowing full well that the people watching their program are sitting at home on a pension and a fixed income and are eating cat food and sending them $10. Don't worry, Jesus says. They'll get what's coming to them. They'll eventually fall from those pedestals, just like all those other folks we seek to throw up on the pedestals themselves. Why do we do that? I mean, even if we're not trying to get up there, why do we put somebody else up high, hold them up and say, that's the way it is? Isn't that what we do with the next character in the text before us? The next person upon whom Mark shines the spotlight? The widow and her might, we call it. Jesus sat down opposite the treasury, watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums, and then Mark, Mark alone tells us, a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins worth about a penny. Now, before we get to this exemplary widow, I think there's a few things worth noting. First, Mark says that Jesus was opposite the temple treasury, which would have been in the temple complex something called the Court of the Women. It's the middle courtyard between what was called the Court of the Gentiles, which is where Jesus drove out the money changers. This is where non-Jewish people could come and sort of peek their head in and go, what's this place like? Oh, take a picture over there. Now, this is a big place. And then it was on the other side of the court of the women were the court of the men, reserved only for Jewish men. Jewish women were not allowed to enter the court. Guess where they could go as far as? I'll give you a hint. The court of the women. And this is where Jesus was. Now, I'd like to think it was a stroke of genius on the part of Herod the Great and his architects to put the treasury not in the court of the men, but in the court of the women. Because after all, women tend to be more generous than men, and men tend to be more generous when there are women around to impress them. And so here in the court of the women is where Jesus is, watching the temple treasury, watching his people come and put their money in, rich folks putting in a lot, and then this little widow. Now, I don't know about you, I don't know where your mind goes, but when I imagined the temple treasury, I used to think of it like a night overnight deposit box at the bank, right? Just a little mechanized hole in the wall. Maybe you pull something down, slide your little money in, slide it back up. But no, the temple treasury wasn't like that at all. In the court of the women were 13 trumpet-shaped boxes all around the court. And this is where people gave their offering. And it wasn't folding money. They didn't swipe a card. They didn't write a check. They had coins. And so into these tuba-shaped things, they'd toss in their metallic coinage that would clang all the way down the horn and into the box, attracting the eyes and ears of everyone in the court who to see who was giving such a large amount. I saw this thing work out one time at a backyard Bible club. 
Y'all ever notice when the plate comes around, a little carpet in the center? We were doing a backyard Bible club at a little church. Didn't have that carpet in it. The kids found out real quick. You drop a quarter in, it goes, ding! You drop four dimes. Ding, ding, ding! So kids started wondering, how much can I put in there? Make everybody look at me. That's what happened at the treasury. And Jesus is sitting there watching when he notices many rich people putting in large sums, big handfuls of coins, bang, bang, all the way down. But it's he alone who takes notice of a poor widow who came and put two just slivers of copper, smallest coins in the, in, in, in the world, in the, in the circulation, took these two copper coins and just slid them into the treasury, attempting to go unnoticed. Mark tells us they were worth about a penny. She put in a penny. A penny. You know what you can buy for a penny? Another penny. That's it. Now, I know some of you can remember when you could go to the drugstore and buy a Tootsie Roll for a penny, or that song we used to sing about the weasel going pop said you can get a needle and a spool of thread for a penny. But today, do you know there's a movement in our country to get rid of pennies? Did you know that? Get rid of them. It it costs more to make pennies than they're worth. Just round everything up to a nickel. You probably want to do that anyway. You know, there's moments everybody, everybody does this. Maybe you've done it. You come home at the end of the day, you empty out your pockets. There's my pocket knife, my wallet, whatever else. Oh, there's a little bit of coins down there. Oh, I'll keep that quarter. Need it for the buggy at Aldi. There's a nickel. There's a penny. Penny? You just throw it in the drawer with the old batteries and ketchup packets. Pennies? Nobody wants no, Nobody wants a penny. But that's all she gave. A penny. If you drop one in the seat of your car, are you going to pull over to fetch it out? No. She dropped into the treasury a penny. But what's more is how much it was worth to her. Jesus saw something there. He said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who were contributing to the treasury. Now which one of them do you think wanted to say but didn't? My money's on Peter. Now, Jesus, I don't, I don't recall seeing a woman, but if he, she was a widow, she probably didn't have anything. And if it was a penny, you hear it right now, bang, bang. People just giving their money into that treasury. There is no way she's out giving any of these folks. Did you see some of the cars in the temple parking lot? She ain't out giving these folks. And Jesus goes on to say, for all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in every she had all she had to live on now if we leave it right there we've got every sermon ever preached about stewardship I bet some of you feel your checkbooks even sort of getting a little little queasy when you read it giving to God is supposed to come from a place of sacrifice a place of giving out of one's need not out, out of one's want And that's true, and I'm going to leave that right there and let you and the Lord dance with that later. I will tell you, though, that I absolutely believe that giving ought to come from a place of our need and not from what's extra, that it ought to cost us something. It ought not to be some accounting afterthought that gives us a better tax break. But I'll talk more about that some other time. I'm not entirely convinced, though, that this is the reason Jesus calls his disciples together to point out the widow and her gift. Because why? Why would Jesus call attention to her? Why does Jesus point out certain people along our path in following him at all? Why does Jesus ever in our mind say, pay attention to that one? I don't believe it's so Jesus can say to us, see, there's one who has it all figured out. There's one you ought to hold up as the perfect Christian, one whose face should be cast in bronze and placed in the church foyer, one whose name ought to be etched in brass below the window on the baptistry. One whose image should be in oil and canvas and placed in the hall along with the other legends of the faith. I don't think that's what Jesus is doing. No, when Jesus calls them unto our attention, it isn't so we can place them on the untouchable pedestal and say to ourselves, well, we'll never be as holy as they are. When Jesus points to someone, when Jesus highlights someone in our lives, it's not so we can put them on a pedestal, but so as to say, this is the way you do it. She's the rule, not the exception. And isn't that hard? My, I'd, rather, I'd rather just go on and call this the story of the widow's might. Make it a nice little fable from Scripture. 
To use this woman as some noble example of what perfect discipleship is, what it could be like, to hold her up and then tell myself, I can never be as holy as her. I can never give as much as her. To just make it enough to say, well, yeah, like these others, I'm giving out of my abundance, but at least I acknowledge, acknowledge that I can never be like her. Keep her at an arm's length, put her on the pedestal. And then I can keep Christ calling as some far off, out there thing that I'll never be able to reach because I'm not like her. Because I can't do it the way she did. That's not what Jesus does. But that's what we do whenever we call someone a saint. That's what we do when we decide that someone has reached a higher level of holy. We decide that they're different from us. Able to do things we can't. Gifted by God with more spiritual awareness, more giftedness, a higher tolerance for sacrifice, and therefore we're off the hook. But friends, the truth is, there's not a single soul in this world more gifted or capable than another when it comes to living into the fullness of that to which Christ calls us. We are all the same. You are no better equipped than anyone else, and no one else is better equipped than you. Because Christ calls us all, all of us to the same life, the same way. She is not the exception. She's the rule. And I know, I know that's a hard road to hoe. That's a tough truth to take hold of. After all, on my wall in my office are three images. There's Mary Flannery O'Connor. There's Clarence Jordan. There's Jesus. Whenever I see Clarence, I, I want to think that he was just born better than me with more gifts and more guts than I'll ever have. That way, I can have an ouch, you know. I'm no Clarence Jordan. An excuse for when I wilt under the social pressure to keep quiet and let the status quo grind on. I'm no Clarence Jordan. I can't be like him. But friends, Clarence was no better or worse than me. I want to believe that someone like Rosa Parks was just born with more courage than I've got, more determination and a stronger spine to injustice. But she and I are both made in the image of God, called by Christ to change the world for the better. I want to see this poor widow in Mark's story and say, oh, I can never be like her. But Jesus says, no, this is the rule, not the exception. So what's the difference? What's the difference then? Why call attention to the widow's gift, the gift of all she had? Why are there these seeming giants of the faith who I want to believe are better than me? What's the real difference if there's no difference at all? Well, you want to know? I'll be honest with you, I don't want to know. I'm not really sure I do because I'm convinced that the difference, the only difference, is that these people we place on the pedestals of piety, these people whose images we form in our stained glass windows, they just love God with a love so deep and sincere that they actually believe what God says. They love Jesus so much that what they give, what they offer is not a sacrifice, not a risk, but a glad offering of praise and thanksgiving. Because it's not theirs anyway. It's not yours. It's not mine. It's like they actually believe Jesus. Like they actually believed him when he said, do not worry about what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, about what you will wear. Is not life more than food, the body more than clothing? He says, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour of, to the span of your life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the fields, he says, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet Solomon didn't look as good as they do. But if God clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today, tomorrow burned in the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore, Jesus says, do not worry, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? It's the Gentiles who strive for these things. But strive first, Jesus said, for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. 
and all these things will be given to you as well. It's like they believed him when he said it. It's like they believe what Jesus said. Like these folks we call saints believed what Jesus said. Now just imagine if we actually believed it too. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we hear your words and we want to believe them. We want, Lord, so desperately not to be, be those who say, well, we can't do it that way. We can't have that faith. Because, Lord, we know you give it to us. So, Holy Spirit, come and help us. Give us strength. Give us your spirit to, to listen to your words, to believe them. And, Lord, to believe them with more than just our minds to believe them with all of who we are. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.